sticks with me. Sister Pauline's work is such a strong example to me of the power of women's work because it has accomplished so much with so little. In a country where women are most assuredly the second sex, where all traditions hold that women who are widowed by HIV AIDS must be purified by having sex with a man in the community so as to rid themselves of their husband's spirit, where orphaned children are left at the doorstep, if they're lucky, of local orphanages, since there is no one left to take care of them, Sister Pauline has managed to bring hope and dignity to the women of poverty-stricken Western Kenya. She has helped to oppose the purification ritual by getting women to unite in their opposition to it. She has stressed the importance of women's education, since without it, women have no chance to improve their lives. And she works tirelessly to keep her school and admission going in the face of obstacles that would daunt most of the rest of us. In fact, uh, about two years before we got there, we heard a story that scared us all, that the, um, actually the school had been attacked by some um, bandits who killed a security guard. They were looking for money because the school had just started and they thought there would be a lot of tuition money. Um, and so I said to her, um, well, what kind of support do you receive from the local church? What kind of support do you get from the bishop? <coughs> She just looked at me and she said, she really didn't deal with the bishop very much. His main concern was, was whether the sisters were wearing their habits. He drives a Mercedes. Now, I think the last thing on Sister Pauline's mind is whether or not she wants to be a bishop. Her concerns are with the people in her community. But think of the contributions that she has made and think of what the church would be like if people like Sister Pauline had a greater voice. Another African sister, one whom I actually taught when I was a faculty member at Duquesne, was, and this is a true story, she was removed from her position as superior of her community in Nairobi when she persisted in complaining to the local bishop about some of his priests who pressured her nuns to have sex with them for money. The nuns found it very difficult to turn this down because their families were starving and they were being offered some nice sums of money. How could they live in such comfort with food and shelter and education and while their families were starving? And this sister went to the bishop and she said, this I have to stop and I'm going to keep at you. And the bishop did not want to be told what to do by a nun. Now, my point is not here to paint a picture of good nuns and bad priests in Africa. It's unfair to the majority of African clergy who do work tirelessly on behalf of justice. But these stories suggest a larger picture, and I was there two weeks the larger picture which begs for women's gifts in much greater numbers. It's unfortunate that the larger system in which Sister Pauline works doesn't support people like her. She is an extraordinary woman who has been able to overcome the many obstacles to women's flourishing, and she is working her hardest to ensure that the women she teaches and supports can now begin to overcome these obstacles. But the larger message from the church is that women are receptive. They receive, nurture, and carry out the initiatives that comes from them. In Sister Pauline's case, you can easily see what would happen if she found the script. Now let me tell you another story. I have here. Two years ago, a student showed up at my door one afternoon. I had never had her in class. She had come to see me after she had gone to talk to someone else on campus, and this person had referred her to me. Karen had just been to a protest against the School of the Americas in Fort Benning, Georgia. And she had watched as an older sister, a nun, put herself forward and was then arrested for trespassing. Karen, who had a strong concern for social justice, had really never given much thought to feminism. Like many others her age, she assumed that most of the battles that women had fought about equal opportunity were, were won, and she could not, and she was the beneficiary of these victories. The issue of women's ordination really didn't interest her. There were other more important things for her to concern herself with, like Yet, as she witnessed the arrest of this nun, she was suddenly struck by the thought that this woman could and did put her body on the line for her faith. And yet, she could not represent Christ at the altar. And as she described this insight to me, she said it was as if a bolt of lightning had hit her. And she just came back a changed woman. So she came to Loyola wondering what she could do. She went to ministry. I'm so upset about this. And someone said, go talk to Susan. <coughs> so I was really fortunate. So Karen's concern was that so many of her peers didn't think of this. They just weren't thinking of this. And they didn't even wonder about the reasons. So we talked for some time. And I gave her in brief 
my own understanding of the church's official position. I, I make it really a point that when students ask this question, I say, go home and read these documents. I want you to understand what the church does. It's not like, we don't like women. It's much more complex. Now, she had never actually understood the reasoning, so after we talked, she asked me if I would agree to give what I had said as a talk, so I did. And over the next few weeks, Karen and some of her peers and folks from university ministry put together a series of lectures that were presented throughout the rest of the academic year. And I started off the series by talking about the Vatican's position on women's ordination, and it was followed by a number of other presentations related to women's work in the church. I think for all concerned, the series was immensely informative. Uh, it was amazing. Um, Jim has been there. There are 40 or 50 people at most of these talks, which is incredible. And it gave the students, faculty, and staff at Loyola a forum to talk about issues concerning women in the church. Uh, Karen graduated, and I recently heard from her. She's working at a social service agency in New York. She was trying to assist a Palestinian woman who wants to come to the U.S. for education, and she's put together a documentary film on young women in the church. And she recently asked me for advice about how she might best think about her future, and I made some suggestions. Now, Karen, unlike so many of my students, has not given up on the church. She's working as best as she can to better the lives of the people she works with in New York and beyond the borders of this country. And she has what I, what I can only call a zeal for justice, which she learned at Loyola. She continues to work to educate women, men, and children. Now, when I reflect on women like Sister Pauline and Karen in relation to the ideas of femininity that are presented by the church, I experience a sense of disconnect. Certainly, they are both nurturing and certainly they have been receptive to the gifts that God has given them. But to consider their lives as living out the bridal metaphor of receptivity, of the special gift for nurture, of responding, seems to leave out some very important things. Both of these women, and many others like them, have not only been receptive, but also challenging. They have listened carefully to what they have been taught, but they have also raised profound questions about what they ought to be doing. These women have all exercised a prophetic gift. They have spoken truth to power, as the book of Project by Carrie Kennedy puts Their work has been to use the name of a Husha that was popular when I was a kid, to tell the truth. Now, I think that there are many ways that we as women and men in the church can offer gifts to the church. We offer the gifts of our time, money, talents, experience, education. But telling the truth and speaking this truth to power is one of the most profound gifts I think that can be given. Now to finish up. We've come a ways from my original question, can God be a bride? <coughs> and in my America article, I answered yes that men and women are both created in God's image. God is no more a bridegroom than a bride. Since all of our language for God only suggests the deep and unspeakable mystery that God is. But I would like to close by suggesting that for many women, being a bride doesn't mean passing from bodily to spousal control. Being brides means taking on a partnership with another as an equal in helping to build up the, the, the term that uh, Ayn Marie Estazi Diaz uses, the kingdom of God. Being a bride means not only receptivity to the other, as God is receptive to relationship with us, but also to actively working with others for greater honesty, greater justice in the church and in the world. In this sense, we are all brides and grooms to each other, perhaps better yet, partners, friends, and lovers. And in, indeed, a colleague of mine has suggested that it may well be the case that some same-sex couples can teach heterosexual couples a great deal about mutuality and equality 